You have to press the button on the left there. Um, okay. Well, we've got um, no viewers and no guests at the moment. <laughs> uh, is it worth ringing Damien? I uh, just thought maybe Josh has got the wrong time zone, isn't it? Well, we have one viewer so far, so I'm hoping a few others are going to join. And I'm hoping we're also going to be joined by two guests, Josh Stearns from the uh, Geraldine Dodge Foundation and Damien Radcliffe. Um, we do have some questions lined up, and we were a little bit late on air, so that's probably something we've gone away. I have a few more coming in there. So um, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes, and apologies for the late start. Uh, just wait two more minutes to see how many people join us, and then we'll get going. Um, those of you who are now watching, I hope you can hear and see OK. If you want to type questions, there is the um, uh, question function on Google Hangout, and you can just type some questions there, and I'll pick them up. And Josh and Damien, when they join us, will we'll pick them up as well. Uh, if not, we've got a few questions that um, people have asked uh, on the course and under the course modules over the last week or so that we'll we'll start to talk about. So we're just going to wait a couple more minutes. There we are. Someone's come in. Are we going to wait for some other minutes for others? Yes, we are. <laughs> so uh, we're just going to wait two more minutes. And apologies, uh, Marilise there. Um, apologies for the slight late start and a bit of a, a technical hitch getting going. But we're just going to wait two more minutes and see if either of our guests come or a few more people join in the broadcast and then we'll start. So just hang on for a moment. So I hope you're all uh, enjoying the course and getting on with the modules all right. Um, as I was saying uh, to some of you who were there, we have uh, the chance for you to type questions in. Please get going. Feel free to ask any questions you want about the course, about community journalism in general, or um, uh, uh, indeed anything else associated with the course of journalism. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to start answering some of the questions that were asked earlier while we wait for uh, Josh Stearns from the Geraldine Dodge Foundation and Damien Radcliffe, hopefully, to join in, because they're more interested than me. Um, so we seem to have 13 viewers. Uh, I'm going to start off, I think, just ask, asking, answering a few of the questions that, um, that people have asked in advance. Um, I haven't got names on these uh, questions, I'm afraid, but um, uh, they do tend to group together. So um, I should say one of the things I won't be doing is answering some of the technical questions about WordPress. I know some people will have some technical questions about WordPress and in, in embed, embedding widgets and, and how you launch your best site. We're going to have another Hangout, hopefully one that will start earlier and, uh, and run more smoothly, uh, with Glyn Motter's head uh, in a week or so's time. And Glyn will be able to answer all of those technical questions far better than I can. And I know better than to try and answer uh, things that I don't, uh, don't know enough about. Um, but the first question here, what is your thought on having a cover price for a community paper? Um, I suppose that entirely depends on, on the community and whether it can stand uh, a paid cover price so, and the size of it. So um, uh, the community uh, papers that I know of, some of them are very small. And to be honest with you, people wouldn't pay a cover price. Um, uh, but as they grow and develop and the content strengthens and gets more regular and more consistent, then they can start to attract advertising and in due course perhaps start to to offer a cover price. And the Caffili Observer, I think, is one example of that. I believe the Caffili Observer has a cover price. And it certainly has plenty of advertising now and is starting to move into being a mainstream newspaper in many ways, having grown from very much a community website. So, I mean, I think the answer to having a cover price is, is you know, where you are on that journey from starting off simply being a website to or a newsletter uh, to, you know, filling out, developing the content more, um, uh, I was going to say professional, I meant that with a small p, 
but a more polished uh, product that people will be prepared to pay for uh, and offering content that they're prepared to pay for. And in the end, that's, that's you know, the judgment that you, you have to make. Um, uh, I'm just checking out some of these uh, other questions here while we, we wait and hope one of the others will be able to join us. Um, what advice do you have for the a hyper local setting a brand benchmark for journalism? Uh, I'm not quite sure what's behind that. Uh, if whoever asked that question is watching, feel free to, to type a clarification. But I think um, uh, you know, a hyper local or community site needs to set its own terms and its own values. Um, so I don't think you should think of it in terms of setting a brand benchmark for all journalism. Um, you should think in your own terms about the service and the community um, service that you offer and, and being true to your own values as a service um, and living up to that. And that's really as much as you can hope to do, I think. Um, how do you know what's good material that will be of interest to lots of people in your area and not just something that interests you? Well, by talking to the community and being part of the community. One of the things that I hope we'll talk to Josh Stearns about if he, if he manages to log in um, is exactly that, because he in uh, the US has done a lot of work on how you are of the community and broadcasting with the community, not to the community. Um, so really, you have to be communicating with the community. You have to understand what the issues are that matter to them. Hopefully, you can involve them in the reporting or developing the issues and the understanding that you need to, to be able to report it properly. And therefore, um, you know, you will be able to hopefully therefore offer something that's of real interest. So I think very much this is about being of and with the community, not, you know, uh, reporting to and, and having that separation, if you like. And of course, a lot of the digital tools and the techniques that we've been talking about in this course are very much focused on, on making sure you are uh, working with the community and not just broadcasting to them. Uh, Irving Carrera has just um, asked a question here on uh, on Google Plus. Will there be a service that can help us with the technicalities of WordPress? Yes, Irving, I was saying just a few minutes ago, perhaps before you joined, that um, Glenn Motter said we'll be doing one of these. Um, we'll we'll let you know when might be next week, might be the start of the week after, in order to try and mop up all of those technical issues that you may have with WordPress. And Glenn's the expert um, to try and do that. I, I'll be frank with you, I don't know enough about WordPress to try and dive in with both feet and help you with those things. Um, but we will be having a, a live hangout um, and other means for you to, to ask Glenn questions. If you do have questions at the moment, by all means, put them up on the site and we'll, we can point Glenn to them and try and get you a written answer on the site. But there will be a live hangout for a Q&A around WordPress and technical issues uh, in a few days' time. Uh, so if uh, anyone else wants to ask specific questions and maybe even get a discussion going between us and this uh, Google Plus technology, feel free to uh, ask the questions here and I'll, uh, I'll do my best. And, uh, for those of you who are just joining and the numbers are creeping up, I'm pleased to see. Uh, we are hoping that we'll have uh, Josh Stearns from the United States and Damien Radcliffe joining in the discussion a bit later, because if not, you're going to get very bored with my voice, I'm sure. Um, feel free also on the questions to put up anything that, um, uh, you know, you, you, any reaction or response to uh, the course so far or to the modules or anything that you're unsure about. Now's your chance to, uh, to plug away. I'm here and I've got some uh, Nathan Roberts and uh, some of the team who are behind the MOOC here who hopefully we will be able to help you. Uh, I'm just picking up other questions here that have been asked on the site. Um, so uh, will the government intercede in local publications and impose guidelines for them as they do with radio broadcasts? Well, it depends where you live, I suppose. Um, at the moment, um, uh, you know, in the UK here, there is regulation for traditional broadcasting but the web is unregulated and certainly websites or audio over the web and mobile is unregulated and I don't think it's very likely that regulation is going to come in for it. I don't know what the situation is in, in every other country, but in most countries I think digital content over the web in that way is uh, unregulated. Um, obviously in China and in some other areas it's closely uh, monitored, um, but uh, uh, overall it's less regulated than formal broadcasting or formal press in some countries. So I think it's unlikely that the governments in general are going to try to intercede on the community level, but it will vary according to where you live and, and also to the kind of journalism that you're trying to do, I suppose, to some extent as well. Um, let me just try and pick up some other questions here and feel free to ask more. How can we get resources for funding our hyper-local media, sponsors, advertising, 
crowdfunding could be a good alternative. It could be helpful, but it's difficult to achieve. Well, again, uh, I'm not sure where you are in uh, in the uh, modules. I think possibly next week there is uh, a module about um, business models and defining success and how you go about building a, a sustainable business model. Um, I think in the end, sponsorship is one possibility if you can find local organizations or foundations that are prepared to sponsor. That's certainly one possibility. And um, there are examples of that certainly here in the UK. The Carnegie um, Foundation has sponsored or offered some grants to sites to help them uh, establish themselves. A lot more of that kind of philanthropy in the United States. Um, in terms of advertising, it's really about the numbers of regular readers or viewers that you manage to attract. And if you can show the analytics that show you have uh, a significant enough regular audience or readership, then it's more likely that you're going to be able to get advertisers. So it's about being able to demonstrate how well you're performing as a service to be able to attract some form of funding, be it sponsorship, um, grant, or advertising. Um, crowdfunding is definitely an option. And again, that will depend on what value people place on what you're offering. But I think it's, it's not easy, but it's certainly worth uh, having a go and thinking about Kickstarter uh, and other services like that. But there is going to be, um, if you haven't reached it yet, uh, uh, a couple of modules all about how you define success for um, hyperlocal and also uh, how you start to build out business models and, and sustainability and different approaches to doing that. Um, okay, we have some, uh, Irvin here is asking a few questions, so thank you very much for that. But um, also, here we are. A lot of other questions coming in, just give me a moment to read them. So, uh, Moranis, do you think hyperlocal would give a good competition to traditional news agencies? Uh, what do you think? How will traditional news agencies react? Will they try to cooperate with hyperlocals or not? Well, again, this varies. If it works well, they're complementary um, because hyperlocal is focused on one small area and the traditional news organizations tend to be have a much bigger and broader spread. So, you know, there are examples of good partnerships between hyperlocals uh, and um, more traditional news agencies and more traditional news outlets where they, the bigger organizations will help pay for um, information and news that the hyperlocal is able to offer, and particularly if it's able to offer it to a good professional standard. Uh, on the other hand, some news organizations do see hyperlocals as competition, particularly if they become more and more successful. And I've certainly seen examples of that where a hyperlocal started quite small and grown and been successful in a particular community and the local newspaper or whatever has started to see it as competition. Um, but I think you know there are ways of building it as a, uh, a partnership, a win-win partnership, because hyperlocals should be doing something different um, and they're very focused on the community, much more connected to the community, of the community, than a news organization is ever likely to be. And therefore, I think there are opportunities to build um, a good partnership where the newspaper can either provide resources or money or simply profile and reach uh, that a hyperlocal would struggle to do and the hyperlocal can provide the news and information that sometimes uh, traditional news organizations struggle to get as well. So um, it, I think it's worth talking and having discussions if you get to uh, that, that position, if you're successful and sustainable enough. Uh, and there are certainly models and examples uh, of where that has worked well, but also there are some examples of where it's been seen as competition. So it really depends on, on how successful you are. So thank you for that one, uh, Merrilise. Um, uh, Irvin Carrero, again, we all have some specific passions that we would like to share with our community. Should we share this type of information as editorial content? Yeah, why not? Um, I, I don't see, uh, I don't think that's a large part of what hyper, hyper locals and community journalism is about, is sharing those passions and sharing them with the community. And one of the things um, uh, that I keep saying is that, you know, community journalism doesn't just have to be a geographic community. It can be communities of interest. So I'm sure we've got people doing the course who are thinking about running a service or a site, which is not just about a local geography, but is more about uh, a hobby or a passion that they're interested in. So, you know, it could be, you know, train spotting, or it could be, you know, whatever it may be, your particular passion, and obviously food or music and all of these things as well. Those are communities of interest rather than um, communities of geography. We tend to talk about hyperlocal as being about a particular geography, but um, it can be about interest uh, as well. Um, so, thank you for those. Um, 
just checking out some other questions. Feel free to, to, ask, to ask more. Um, so, uh, according, so someone's asked here, if I wanted to start a hyperlocal aimed at people immigrating, what would top tips be? Um, I think you've got to work out what they've got in common and, and target it at what they have in common. So is it a particular um, group of um, immigrants that you're targeting, um, particular diaspora? Uh, there was, I think, in week one or two, um, a written piece about um, diaspora community journalism from one of our PhD students, um, uh, Michel, uh, who had, uh, Michael, who had, um, uh, is studying and doing his PhD about exactly that topic. Um, but he's doing it about the Polish community in the UK. Uh, and obviously that kind of diaspora community, expat community, does have a lot in common and you're able to kind of build issues of interest and common interest to them. Or is it more widely about the issues that immigrants face coming into a country and trying to establish their lives here and trying to deal with um, the authorities and the bureaucracy and establishing a life and schools and all the rest of it? You know, there'll be a set of common interests and common issues that that people face wherever they may come from, and in which case that is, you know, the, the bonding set of issues that you need to focus on. So as a topic, I think it's a perfectly viable topic for our, a community service in that way, but you've just got to define exactly what community of people it is you're trying to address and what their issues are and what they're particularly interested in, and then focus on on serving that and, and trying to, to find the right channels to reach them and, and, and get them to, to know about and discover your particular service. So it's about what is what is it that bonds the community and how do you address uh, all of those issues. Um, I'm just checking some of the earlier questions. Um, we, the viewers are going up. All of you, you can ask questions here on Google on the live Hangout. Feel free to, to um, type them out on the uh, question function that's on Google+. Google Plus. Uh, I'm still hoping that we may discover Josh Stearns or Damien Radcliffe at some stage able to join us. You might have to invite. Uh, I've got to try and invite them again. So if you just give me a moment while I try and work out some of the functionality here, we'll see if we can uh, do that. If you just hang on a second. Um, here we go. Um, Inviting payment again, and then we'll just invite. Watch again, and we'll see what happens. Hopefully, they'll uh, they'll come and join us shortly. Um, anyway, G Google Plus is great for Hangouts, but um, but sometimes we struggle to get it to work quite as smoothly as we'd all hope. Okay, Marilise, we're. Good. We've got uh, Irvin and Marilis asking questions. The rest of you, feel free to, to join in. Uh, you'll find a, a kind of question bar on one side, uh, and they come up here, and I'll do my best. So, Marilis, if we have press councils or some other organisations who somehow control that the news are biased in traditional news, then should content of hyperlocals also be checked that way? So, a bit as I was saying earlier, there isn't really a great deal of regulation around the web in most countries. Um, uh, there are in some, and, you know, China and Iran and, and some autocratic countries who do try and monitor and closely control what's said and, and done on the web. But in most countries, there isn't really any regulation or it's far um, lighter and uh, lighter touch than it is for broadcasting or in some places for press. So um, uh, I, I don't, uh, I think um, uh, those kinds of regulation are unlikely to become the normal standard for community journalism. Because there may be some cir circumstances in which a, com uh, a community site would want to be regulated. Um, here in the UK, if you place yourself under one of the new re press regulators that we have here, it gives you certain protections in terms of your liability for being sued and, and, and for other things. So um, placing yourself into some form of um, light touch regulation does offer some protections and some advantages as well. So it will vary from country to country uh, and the regulatory regime in each country is going to be very different. Uh, by and large, um, digital services are much less regulated than any other. 
Um, but there may be circumstances in which there will be advantages if there are, um, you know, protections and so on uh, in place if you if you put yourself under under the umbrella of a particular regulator. But by and large, um, uh, regulation uh, not really in favour of it for digital services, and I don't think it's in most countries it's going to become the norm. So thank you for that, Meredith. Narina Plunkett, hyperlocals don't necessarily mean for geographical communities, but also those who have common interests. Would you recommend a message board forum website as part of an online community or social platform? Facebook groups don't always work, I feel. Um, yeah, by all means. I think it's, um, I would see that personally as a kind of secondary development. I think you need to get the kind of um, news information service um, going first. You know, what are the issues that the particular community, whether it's a community of interest or a geographical one, going um, and provide some information and, and so on of use to them and then a kind of second tier of functionality could well be a message board or a forum there are a number out there that are um, free to plug into your site or very easy to plug in um, Glenn Mottershead is going to be doing one of these uh, live hangouts uh, either next week or the start of the week after and can talk to you more about what you can plug into WordPress and what the options are so uh, feel free to um, to check back in one of the future hangouts to talk to Glenn about the technical issues around that. But there are certainly plugins that give you some forum or uh, message board functionality. And if you have a if you have built up an audience, and that's the crucial thing, then I think that's a great idea to give them somewhere to discuss things and, and to interact. And that'll be a source of information. And you can, you know, be of the community, as I keep saying, and and, and helping the community to to talk to itself, as it were. Um, so uh, I think they are uh, a good idea, but I do think you have to build your audience and establish your audience and what your proposition to the audience is first, uh, otherwise they're not going to be there. I, I always say social media is called social for a reason. You know, if you just start doing something in your front room, not many people are going to find you, but if you go to where people are or where people naturally gather and start talking to them, then you know, you're going to be more successful. So what that means is you have to find the, the topics and the subjects and the areas and the way of communicating that the particular group of people you're trying to address um, naturally take to and, uh, and try and meet them with that. So thank you for that, uh, Narina. I hope that uh, that helps. Um, George O'Neill's just getting to grips with Google Plus. Seem, well, so are we, it seems, even though we've used it several times. Uh, loving the course, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, on a community radio station, but many want just to be DJs, not to talk to the local community. Uh, so I make you feel validated. Well, I'm delighted about that, George. I'm glad I, I, I build up your validation and self-esteem. Um, yeah, of course, lots of people just want to play music, but actually I think uh, audiences uh, will naturally uh, want to talk about issues and information and so on as well. So I, I, I would encourage you to keep doing the, uh, the information and the news bit as well and not just play music, much as I like listening to music, but um, there is real community value to be had out of uh, providing some, some form of information service. So uh, carry on. Uh, so that's George, uh, Julie Durant, Durant, Durant. Uh, do organizations such as the BBC use hyperlocals as sources of info? And did I, in a previous post with the BBC? Um, yeah, I mean, news organizations will lose, use anything they, they can as a source of information. Um, uh, they, there are some discussions with the BBC about whether they offer you know, some kind of partnership uh, with local news providers, which might extend to hyperlocals by which I mean sharing video, they would provide video of, you know, uh, whatever events they're covering that are locally relevant in return for, you know, being able to use information. There are very, I don't think the BBC has a kind of formal channel for just, you know, pointing, um, uh, 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 you know, taking hyperlocal content and, and, and distributing it on their behalf. Um, but there are some partnerships being discussed and of course all news organizations will look to hyperlocals as a source of information. And we've now been joined by Damien Radcliffe. Hello, Damien, can you hear me? Ah, seems you can hear me, but I can't hear you. So um, keep working at, uh, at seeing if you can get the microphone up. Hello? No, a little, little microphone with a line through it came up then. We can see your lips move, but we can't hear you, Damien. So um, I don't know if that's me or uh, anyone else. If anyone else can hear Damien, could you just let me know in the questions thing, because it may just be this uh, laptop. But anyway, we're hoping we're going to get Damien up and um, be talking to him shortly. Uh, so, Julie, thank you very much for that question. Irvin's back. 
what are my thoughts about publishing a black and white newsletter, letter size, before migrating to a tabloid sized newspaper? Uh, I mean, I think that's a good idea. I mean, you know, basically, you've got to establish what you can do that's viable and sustainable. And I think if people uh, uh, wanted to go into print and wanted to jump straight into doing a tabloid newspaper, that is an enormous task. So I would start off small and get that to work and then build. Uh, and I think that's um, you know obviously going to be um, uh, you will learn along the way and you're much more likely to build something that's sustainable in that way. Um, and and you know that many people start off on the website and then go into newsletters and then build up the pagination and, and eventually become something more akin to newspapers. So uh, start small and grow uh, and build on success rather than jumping in the deep end and hoping for the best. Um, Susan Mann, why can't I see the live broadcast? I don't know, I'm afraid, but um, it's here. If you can tune in, I hope you manage to find it eventually, Susan. Um, and I hope we also manage to get Damien back. Uh, but at the minute, I don't think he's there. No, thanks, Irving. No, I can't hear Damien either, and uh, his picture seems to have frozen as well. So um, who knows? We'll, uh, we'll hopefully uh, crack that one before uh, too much longer. Um, Meantime, keep the questions coming, and I'll, answer, I'll try and answer some more um, uh, from the, the ones that have been posted on the site. Um, so just having a quick look through here. Um, how much skills, as we're not journalists and experienced, do we need to run our own hyperlocal site in printed media? How many people do we need? What kind of skills? Because one person is not uh, powerful or sufficient. Well, that's true. It's um, uh, uh, a really big task to think that one person without the skills could launch a printed newspaper, um, though I think you can um, definitely build up to that. Um, and as I was saying before, I think you need to do two or three things. You need to start small uh, and learn as you go and build on success. Build your community, build an audience that, that know you and find you and want to use you, and then you can start to build up in size. In due course, you know, you can do, uh, hopefully, uh, deals with printers and so on. You can start with a newsletter, um, working out the costs of printing and distribution and so on as well, and, you know, getting all of that to work. But there'll be a financial implication there. The other thing you need to do is, is uh, hopefully, build out a team who can support you. And that, that may not be that everybody has kind of uh, an equal say in, in, in how it's run. But, you know, you can't do everything yourself forever, for a long period of time. And I think a lot of community sites start off with one person trying to do it either as a website or a newsletter and then if it's going to be sustainable they quickly need to build out a kind of team of other people to support them and to help take on other roles and so on as well so you know our experience here in at the university center for community journalism is that um, people start small and then start to build out and start to build a team one of the people, which was one of the case studies early in the course is a good example of that and in the end you need a number of people to be able to take on um, a range of different responsibilities or just simply to be able to keep it going week in week out because it can be uh, um, a bit of a chore otherwise um, so I wouldn't worry too much about the skills you can pick up the skills or you can find people who've got the skills but again it's one of those things about start small start with what's doable what you're able to manage with find your audience build your audience engage them uh, in all the ways that we've been trying to cover on the course and then maybe you can move off into print and start to scale up if you are um, successful enough. Um, so uh, what's going on here? Uh, Narina, thanks for answering your question. It was a pleasure. Uh, so yeah, establish a community first. And you can't hear Damien either. Well, we're hoping he'll come back. I'm just going to try and invite him one more time, see if we can manage that, um, after which I'm sure he'll probably give up because he's probably fed up with trying to do it. Hold on a moment. Sorry about this, I'm just trying to invite Damien again. Um. Okay, well, we'll see if he uh, turns up. Uh, yes, Julie's making the point of please recognize the importance of proofreading. Quite right, Julie. There's clearly a former sub-editor or something there. Uh, yeah, proofreading, that means reading through, getting a second pair of eyes to read through, picking up those spelling areas, those 
errors, those typing errors and literals uh, and making sure it makes sense. There's a, a saying in traditional journalism about you know, nothing should go out without having had two pairs of eyes across it uh, and, and uh, I very much uh, support that. So quite right, Julian, a good prompt there. Uh, now Damien's trying to come back in. Damien, any more success? I hope so. Can you hear me? Well, I can see you again, but we still can't hear you, I'm afraid. So I'm not sure uh, what's going on at your end with um, with microphones. I'm really sorry about that. But, uh, but not getting uh, not getting any sound from you. Uh, keep okay. trying. We, we really want to hear from you if we can. <laughs> As to me. <laughs> As do I. Uh, Marilise is back. Do you think hyperlocal will become a trend for young people to get their news or even start their own hyperlocal <laughs> since they're really familiar with social media and its opportunities? Really good question. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure it's going to be any different generation by generation. It may be for the reasons that you say. They're more used to digital media, more comfortable okay. with um, uh, social media and blogging um, and so on as well. But I think really what's at the heart of it is a passion about your community or a passion about your interest, and that crosses generations. And indeed, many older people, of course, sometimes have the time for it because they may be, you know, partly retired if they get old enough, and you know, uh, uh, you know. A different stage of their career and so on as well, because running community sites can. Sorry, someone's just trying to get some sound up for <laughs> I me. I think here. we can hear Damien. Okay, mate. Hang on, let me just, just uh, see if can get that. Damien, can you try speaking again? Sure. Can you hear Great. me? Great, brilliant. Hey. We've got Damien. Okay, let me just finish that one off. It's only taken so, thirty-five minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice to nice to see you and hear you. Um, Okay, so uh, it, you know, maybe I can see younger people are more um, comfortable with digital and social media, but actually I think it's more about passion and interest in the community or in the, in the topics, and I think that's something that, that crosses generations, really. Uh, my, it's just my personal view. Other people may, may feel very differently about it, but, but what I see at the minute is um, people right across the generations getting involved in, in community media. Uh, thank you for all of those who are saying yes, you can hear him. Um, so, Damien, um, yes, you want to just uh, obviously you uh, presented a module earlier in the um, uh, in the course, which thank you very much. Do you just want to remind people of um, your experience in community journalism and and some of the things that you've done, and then we'll get some questions. Yep, sure. So uh, I've actually done three different modules on the the program this year. Uh, one around journalism another on sustainability and another on measuring success so depending on where you are on the program you may have done none or all of those and I'd be very happy to talk about uh, those questions I know you've touched on some of those particularly around the sort of measuring success element um, already uh, and in terms of my background I mean I started work in local radio very local radio um, for a commercial radio company here in the UK um, before moving to the BBC and then working for a community media organization in partnership with the BBC and then at Ofcom the UK communications regulator doing a range of different research and stakeholder work and really being the sort of champion within that organization for community journalism and, and hyperlocal media and some of you who are doing the program um, through Future Learn and, and the Center for Community Journalism will probably be most familiar with the report I wrote for Nesta back in 2012 called Here and Now, which looked at the state of the UK hyperlocal sector, different ingredients for success and some of the challenges that practitioners were facing. And I think what's interesting for me is that three years on, uh, much of what's in that document remains highly relevant and pertinent today. So I know a lot of you have, have already fed back and said you found it useful, which is great. And um, I'm very delighted to be taking part today and to help address some of your questions. Brilliant, Damien. Thank you very much in, indeed. Um, so uh, I wonder, we had a couple of questions earlier about what is success and particularly about how you make um, a site sustainable in the long term, looking for business models, how you find funding and so on. Now I know that's you know, partly addressed in some of the other um, uh, modules and things that you've done, but you just, just want to talk a little bit about you know, how can people help to make their site sustainable in the longer term and, and how, do they, how should they start to think about success? Yeah, uh, well, I think the sustainability is a is a really interesting question, and perhaps one that often gets gets overlooked or gets only considered in monetary terms. So, on, on the one hand, yes, it's fantastic to bring in advertising or sponsorship or other ty term 
types of revenue. But actually, sustainability and success for me is also about how you encourage and get your community involved. Uh, we have seen a number of different examples of websites like Pits and Pots in Stoke, uh, SR2 um, website in, in Sunderland, Chislehurst News here in, in South London, where the original founders have left because they moved on to other jobs or they had to move, their personal circumstances have changed. And then these fantastic sites have then folded and closed. And I think that that's a real shame when, when that happens. So, in contrast, look at a website like Digbeth is Good, which has had three different people who, who've owned that site. Uh, that's an area in, in Birmingham here in the UK. Or indeed the Bourneville website, Bourneville Village website, again here in Birmingham, where uh, other people have come in and taken over the mantle when the original team have moved on. So I, I think that, that's a really interesting lesson to sort of learn from there about the importance of involving your community yeah, right from the start, you know, across editorial, across design, social events, and, and so forth. Because however excited and passionate you might be about what you're doing now, you don't know what might be down the line. Um, and I'm sure you'd feel saddened and disappointed if your site were, were to close. So actually always thinking about an exit strategy and how other people can be involved I think is something to, to include right from the outset. And, and, and for me, that's a part of also measuring success. On the one hand, yes, it might be about page views and, and so forth, but it's also about the extent to which you get your local community involved. Uh, it is about affecting change or telling stories that perhaps traditional media and other uh, local media outlets are not depicting and giving a voice to those to those elements, be that uh, a local geographic community or a community of interest. So I would sort of say, you know, you don't measure success simply by by page numbers and reach. Actually, you know, you can you can have a fantastic. Um, example of community journalism with a very very small reach, but if it's impactful, then for me that is success. Brilliant, and we, and we have Janet Williams with a, a comment here agreeing with you. Passion is important. Readers will be attracted uh, to your passion, and you'll find like-minded readers. Her site, Chandler's Ford Today, um, was set up two years ago, and now has regular contributors and 700 uh, posts. So congratulations, to that. Uh, Janet. Very well done. Um, uh, any thoughts on how we can use videos such as YouTube in hyperlocal news from uh, Irving Carrero? Well, all, all I would say uh, is that um, uh, you know, video is now incredibly easy to do with smartphones, very easy to take, very easy to edit clips, um, all in a smartphone. And if it's uploaded on YouTube, A, you have your own YouTube channel as a platform, but then you can embed YouTube clips into WordPress sites and um, you, know, you can make links through that they're very viewable on mobiles and so on as well. So um, uh, I would encourage you to um, you know, find stories where you can do you know, quick clip interview, keep everything short and tight, because that's what people um, want, increasingly want these days. Uh, or of course there may be you know, maybe a little bit of video or a still that illustrates a story uh, and embed it on the site and you can click through. And you may well find that being on YouTube as well um, actually increases your reach. You, you, you agree with that, I, I hope, Damien? Yeah, I do, and I think I, I would also encourage people to, to just um, to just film and to experiment, and perhaps to not get too hung up about things like production quality and, and so forth, which perhaps has historically been been a barrier. But actually, if you look at some of the most shareable content across social channels, including YouTube, it's not necessarily beautifully shot or beautifully filmed. And yes, that might be something you aspire to, but great, interesting content still reaches audiences and audiences I think are prepared to be more forgiving on those platforms and also from community journalists than they would be if you were the BBC or CNN and, and so forth. Uh, so the, so we, we are consuming considerably more video as, as consumers now and I think we're also more forgiving about, about how it looks if the content is interesting. Oh, well, and indeed, with many smartphones these days, it, it looks uh, almost professional anyway. Um, we have uh, Michelle Thomason who's asked here, are there any tips to encourage the more timid readers or viewers to make contributions and comment publicly? I think that's about how do you, how do you build an audience and try and encourage people to take part if they're uh, a little bit hesitant to do so. I mean, uh, in the end, you can't force people to, of course, but it's just about having an environment where people aren't sort of challenge is moderating kind of difficult and snarky comments if you get those we'll talk a bit about moderation in a minute in response to another question but you know making it a safe environment for people to step forward and talk and contribute I think is a very large part of it. Damien do you agree? 
I, I do, and I'd also try and say uh, people may be encouraged to contribute and comment in different different spaces. So somebody might feel much more comfortable commenting on something on your Facebook wall because that's a platform they're familiar with rather than a WordPress site. So there is a value to sort of squirting content out across different platforms because people are, are more comfortable with, with different environments. And again, I would also say, don't just measure success by how many comments um, you, you, you've had. You know, you'll get anecdotal feedback from people that you meet in the street or at events and so forth. Who, you know, people often uh, are, you know, think something is great, but don't necessarily feel then compelled to comment and, and tell you that. So comments are great, uh, but don't get hung up on them if you're not getting lots of them. Yeah, and uh, we've got 31 people viewing, but I'd encourage all of the timid ones amongst you to. Get in and comment in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes while you've got a chance. We've got one here from Janet Williams. She's got a non-commercial site at the minute and uses Flickr Creative Commons images, non-commercial, extensively. Uh, and I think we've covered uh, how to do that on the course. Uh, this wouldn't allow her to change the site to commercial and start to uh, charge um, to cover the cost um, as and when the site grows. So I um, uh, want some advice about how to migrate, I suppose, from being non-commercial and able to use things like Creative Commons to being commercial where she's going to have to start paying for the use of images and so on as well. I mean, it, that is a tricky one. It's about how you shift from being you know, a non-profit if you want to move across to, to being profit. And that's all about how you business plan and factor in those extra costs and so on as well. So you know, the costs of image um, Im using images and so on can be tricky. Flickr is a great resource for Creative Commons images for free use for non-commercial purposes. There are stock photo sites. Uh, some of which I think are even free, but certainly a, a number of which are pretty low cost on the web that are available. Um, if they're not included in uh, modules, I'll try and get some links put up um, before the end of the course. Um, but in the end, the costs of those um, copyright licensing issues have to be factored into a business plan for working out whether or not you're viable to go commercial, I think. Damien? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And I think it also depends perhaps on what your business model is so as in you could be uh, not for profit so you're still bringing in income um, and and still have have revenue uh, but that enables you to use different licenses again so it's a complex it's a complex space uh, but you need to be aware of that and then I guess also aware of uh, what are the rights that for contributors? I mean, a lot of hyperlocal sites actively encourage people in their locality to contribute photographs. Many of them contribute fantastic, fantastic images. Mm -hmm. uh, you and they need to be very clear about who owns those images and those rights. Uh, and on images, Marilise has come up here. Tumblr pages where photographers with common interests post their pictures, for example, about ducks. Could that page be considered as hyperlocal? Well, I guess there is a big community of interest around ducks. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's, a, that's a community of interest if there's something that holds it, holds it together. I, I, you know, I don't think we should get too hung up on terms and definitions about does this count as hyperlocal or doesn't it, and what's the difference between citizen journalism and community journalism and so on as well. These are all flexible terms that kind of, you know, there's lots of grey areas between them. Basically, we're talking about how you use the opportunity of digital media to build a kind of ground up. Um, media site that addresses the needs and interests of a particular community, be it geographical or a community of interest, in ways that are possible now that wouldn't have been possible otherwise and are probably not being covered by commercial media. And if duck pictures are your thing, go for it, I'd say. Uh, so thank you for that, Marilise. Um, so uh, Irving's come back here. I think we kind of touched on this earlier, really, but what are some of the things that you can do to make uh, your site is sustainable, the hyperlocal venture sustainable. So, um, uh, Damien, you, you did touch on that earlier. Do you want to just quickly sure. move back on sustainability? Sure. So I think for me, this splits into into two areas. There's there's a question of financial sustainability, and then and then people. So in terms of financial sustainability, when you look at everybody who has managed to do this successfully, the single most important thing that they have done is that they have not put all of their eggs in one basket. So they have used multiple sources of, of income revenue, be that uh, membership, sponsorship, advertising, events, offline materials, and, and so forth. We cover some of this in the module that I did um, uh, later on in the, in the course. So I think the key thing is you need to have multiple income streams. For this financial sustainability, 
And then in terms of human capital, consider how you can utilize the skills of different people in your community to help you with reporting, photography, design, SEO, etc. There will be people who will be delighted to participate and to help you, but often might feel that they're they, they might be shy of making the ask, so don't you be shy in terms of asking uh, the community to, to help you out. I think if you if you make that offer, you'll be surprised at the response you'll get back. Make social media social. Yeah, very good. Okay, Julie Durrant here, who I, I think may or may not have a journalistic past. Julie, you can let me know if you want. Ask, don't, don't you think a knowledge of journalism-type law is important for hyperlocal teams? Yes, we do. It's something that we cover, I think, in the final week. Uh, in a conversation with um, Professor Duncan Broy, our media law professor here at Cardiff, we can't, on a course like this, give a you know full um, media law uh, education, obviously, but we do point out some of the things that people need to think about and be aware of, and perhaps go and find out a bit more about. And that again depends partly on the kind of site that you're doing, but you need to be aware of um, uh, contempt of court and how you report courts if you want to do that. You need to be a little bit aware about um, you know, how to report council meetings and what you're allowed to do in council meetings and what you're not. And some bloggers have got into trouble by trying to film council meetings when it's prohibited and things like that. And of course, you need to be aware of, of libel as well. So there are definitely legal issues. We cover it in the final week of the course in, in a kind of broad outline and point to some of the things that people need to be aware of. Because the point is that you are publishing into the public space and therefore there are issues of media law which apply. So we will cover that in the final week, and you're absolutely right that, um, that people do need to, to be aware of what the law is. It will vary from country to country, of course, but fundamentally there will be issues of, of uh, reporting courts, reporting um, councils or government bodies, uh, and libel that everybody needs to be, uh, needs to be aware of. Uh, I want to pick up one of the other questions here that was um, submitted in advance that we haven't touched on, but it's sort of come up. Um, in the margins, which is how do we moderate comments? If we allow readers greater input, how do we, should we moderate? What do we moderate? What are the legal implications about libel and slander? Well, as I've said, the, the questions about libel and so on certainly apply, but you know, if people um, find that they're getting um, abuse in the comments section on a site or something, Damien, what, you know, do you have views about good practice in terms of moderation? What, you know, what, how should people approach it? I think it's a really interesting topic because uh, if you look more widely across the, the media scene, there are certain organizations who are starting to turn off comments now, uh, or examples from the states where people are saying that actually you have to join and pay a fee to be able to have the right to post comments, and they hope that that stops people from uh, posting inappropriate material and kind of trolling on, on sites. Um, I think the reality is that sort of pre-moderating comments is, is very difficult uh, and probably too time-consuming for most community publishers. So really, you need to just encourage communities to behave in a responsible way and to kind of report to you if there are issues that they have identified and, and encourage the community to self-manage uh, yeah. as, much, as much as you can. And that does happen. I mean, a community will moderate itself largely. If someone's being um, unreasonable, then other people will tend to come in and say, stop it. I mean, the other things you can do are to try and insist that people you know, identify themselves with a real name when they comment. Uh, that tends to cut down the kind of the abuse and the, and the misbehavior rather a lot. And I think the other thing you can do is to set out um, standards on the site. So this is, you know, we expect people to, you know, be courteous to each other, to be constructive, to stay on topic. Uh, and if people don't, then we reserve the right to um, to delete the comment. I mean, I think as long as you're transparent about that and upfront, here's the kind of code for commenting and moderation that we intend to to keep. Set some standards, and um, you know, then I think uh, uh, hopefully as well, people will, will try and stay within those guidelines. And certainly, you've got a perfect opportunity to do something about it um, if they don't. I'd also I'd also add to that, if I may, Richard, that I think if you do delete a, delete a comment or take a comment down then it's worth telling that, that the person who's commented why you have done that and why they perhaps um, stepped out of line and, and are in breach of your code of conduct. Because often this is about educating your users about what is appropriate and what is not. And certainly we've seen in the past that, that, uh, that individuals are, are very responsive to that. They welcome that kind of interaction. They're not necessarily stepping out of, out of line deliberately. They're not aware of the implications of, of what they're of what they're saying. So don't just take something down and and don't communicate the reasons why. Actually, use as an opportunity to to have a dialogue with your audience. Yeah. Now, Julie Durrant said she's not a journalist, but she has worked closely with the local press 
if she was younger, she would certainly have gone down that route. It's never too late, Julie. This is your chance to get out there and start becoming a community journalist. Uh, Irving has come out with another question. Um, journalism around diaspora, we talked about this, I think, before you were able to, to fully join us, Damien, but the idea that you can do you know, sites for um, um, diaspora communities and expat communities and so on as well. But he's asking whether it's more difficult to monetize that type of journalism. I, I suppose it's less straightforward, but I'm sure there will be issues in common um, uh, that those groups have where there may well be advertising opportunities and so on as well. So uh, it's a good question. Um, there's, there's a bit of thought, more thought about than I've been able to give it, but I wouldn't say it's impossible. I'd just say you may require you know, a bit more lateral thinking. I'm sure there are opportunities to, to try and monetize it, but perhaps not as straightforward as they would be for a, you know, a straightforward uh, geographical community, for example. I don't know if you've got any any uh, experience of kind of diaspora sites or anything, Damien. Well, the, there have been a few in the UK around things like Polish communities um, or, or communities of, of expatriates from certain parts of, of Southeast Asia and so forth. So if those communities are of sufficient size, there may well be local advertisers who would be interested in targeting them. And it might well be that you can use Google AdWords as well as, a, as another um, potential revenue source, although it requires kind of fiddling and playing around around with. Uh, so I think it's, it's not necessarily as easy as some of the more uh, geographic specific sites, but I wouldn't discount it. Yeah, okay. Uh, Janet just comes back on the moderation thing. She moderates comments on, on her site and has a, a comment policy and expects comments to align with that. She also asks commenters to set up gravi a Gravatar account and comment through that, which means they show their real name and show the face. And I'm sure that that cuts down any um, potential abuse for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Gareth Hart, I'm running a local newsletter for a community of interest. We do standard events, vacancy stories, and rehash other news of interest. What tips have we got on how to start more investigative, proactive news gathering rather than reactive stories? So um, that's a really good question. How do you go from, from trying to be proactive, from simply being reactive to trying to be a bit more proactive? Um, uh, Damien, anything come to mind? Um, I, I think you have, might want to identify what are the spaces and issues you want to get into and then develop uh, those kind of contacts at a local, at a local level. So that might involve um, getting involved in certain types of campaigns or certain kinds of issues and, and identifying who are, the, who are the main movers and shakers in that space. So if that's a certain person in a local council or member of a, a local police or some, like a safer um, communities team or something like that, that actually you start to cultivate those relationships so they come to you first rather than other media outlets and therefore you then will be being proactive because you'll be taking the lead. I, I think it's, uh, I agree with that, it's partly about being open to it and saying bring us your stories and bring us your issues. I think it's sort of also about asking questions and we have student journalists here at the journalism school at Cardiff and I say one of the things that they simply have to be is relentlessly curious, ask questions about everything. Um, why is it like that? Why has that happened? What, you know, what were, the, what were the, the causes of this? And if you continue, if you find an issue where there are a lot of questions that you think are interesting and will be of interest to your community that are not obvious and not obvious to answer, then you, you've got an investigative story. So it's about developing that curiosity and continually questioning. It's a kind of a, an attitude of mind as much as anything. And finding a topic that's relevant to the audience that, that where there are questions that need to be answered and then you're off and off you go. You could, you could also do like some of the websites like Mashable and TechCrunch and others will do where they have a, a section on their website saying, send us a tip. Exactly. So encourage, encourage your audience to send you ideas and suggestions of things they would like to see you explore. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Vandell, we've only got a couple of minutes, so if, you, if you've got a really burning question, get it in quickly. Catherine Vandell, authenticity and community understanding was stressed in last week's coursework. Yep. I believe this is an easy matter to address in the beginning of a hyper local. Can you address how to sustain authenticity as the following grows? In other words, how do you stay close to the community and of the community as you become bigger and bigger? Uh, it's a good question because when you start out small, you, you have to be of the community, but if you reach size, you can, uh, distance can grow, can't it? What do you, well, what's your experience with some of the bigger hyperlocals as they've grown and developed further and you know, as the tone of them and the, the kind of nature of them changed? Um, I think many of them tr tr try to remain stay staying true to their roots, uh, but I'd say perhaps the, the two most obvious things that you can do to try and address that, I mean, one is just be visible, so if you are reporting on on events like uh, a school fair or a summer fair or kind of things like that, um, 
you might want to be wearing a t-shirt which says who you are and where you are from and talk to people and, and be visible so that they people will um, come and talk to you and, and it's all about being open as you've said many times which you know, just be open be receptive ask inquisitive questions uh, don't be shy uh, the other thing that we've seen uh, that for example Nikki Getgood who used to run Digbeth is Good site in Birmingham used to do was hold open editorial meetings in the pub so she used to say I know every, you know, every fourth Thursday of every month at seven o'clock I'll be in such and such pub come and talk to me about the issues that matter matter to you the things we've been covering on the site Tell us what you think. So find opportunities to create informal focus groups to actually have that ongoing relationship and dialogue with your audience. This is not about air-conditioned journalism. You're not simply just sitting in your spare room or your kitchen producing a community website. You need to be in the community, and they need to know you and interact with you. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry Josh Stearns didn't join us because he his big thing is being of the community, not reporting to the community. Perhaps we'll... Maybe he's got a time difference issue. We're not realizing we've gone forward for summertime here in the UK, but um, hopefully we might um, get some kind of contribution for him before the end of the course. It's 7 o'clock, and I'm afraid we have to stop, not least because I've got to get a, a train in just a few minutes or I miss Easter with my family. Um, I'm very sorry for the technical issues at the beginning, which meant a bit of a delay, but um, we've warmed up now. There will be at least one more of these Hangouts uh, before the end of the course, um, uh, focusing particularly on technical issues around Word, WordPress and so on. Um, but by all means, keep the questions coming on the on the site, um, and uh, we will answer all of those that we can. And as I said, there'll be at least one more of these Google, live Google Hangouts. But for the moment, Damien, thank you very much for persevering, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks. I really, really appreciate your your contribution, and thanks to everybody who's been uh, watching and listening in. This will has been recorded and will, of course, be um, uh, available to view uh, later. But for the moment, thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>